What is prayer? What is God trying to accomplish through prayer? Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us again on Are You Sure? The podcast, where our goal is to inspire Bible believers to become Bible students. If you've been, Amen. yeah, if you've been um, hanging in there with us over the last few episodes, you know that we are strictly about finding the truth within the scriptures and hoping to inspire you to ask yourself, are you sure um, that you are, um, that you have the correct uh, knowledge and understanding of what the Bible is saying. Um, we are in episode 42 now, and we are happy to be here again. And we want to take a moment, as always, to thank everyone that's been supporting the channel. Um, people that's been viewing, sharing, liking, it all counts. Interacting, comments, we love it all. Um, we try to respond to the comments, um, you know, whenever we can, just as long as we keep it all respect uh, respectful. Um, today is a treat. We're going to uh, talk about something that, you know, we may or may not uh, really think about in a way it's important. We we do it as sometimes just a, a mundane kind of process, but yeah, it might not even, yeah, just as a regular exercise. Um, but with that being said, I am D, the troublemaker here with Elder Sykes, the wise guy, and you know who we are if you've been following this. If you haven't, shame on you. You need to go back and after you watch this episode, go back and watch all of the other ones um, because we do really give a good foundation um, to the Bible to bring us up to this point. Um, so prayer. Yes. What is prayer? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's something, as you said, that is very common, of course, amongst believers. You know, pray to God. We all know to pray to God. Mm -hmm. But it was something that really... Um, you know, puzzled me in the beginning of my, I mean, actually, I shouldn't say just the beginning of my Christian experience, throughout my Christian experience, mm -hmm. because the more I learned about God and who he is and, you know, that he knows everything and he, he knows the end from the beginning and there's just nothing that is, you know, um, not open to him. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, why am I, you got to tell him something if he already knows <laughs> you know, what, what, what I'm going to say. And I had this question for a long time and God had to take me through, you know, some, some lessons before he could answer that question. Mm -hmm. But when he answered the question, it was such a bombshell mm -hmm. and I'm like bombshell. And I started to view prayer in a, in a way I never had that, you know, made it very exciting. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as we go into this topic, we have to kind of lay a foundation of some things that God taught me before I could understand, you know, what he is really trying to accomplish through prayer. Okay. And that's, that's another question that we sometimes rarely ask, you know, we think about how things benefit us or we think about, you know, how things restrict us or whatever, what, what God says, but you know, we don't always ask with a sincere desire to understand, you know, his purpose. Why did you, ordain this thing you know what 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 are you trying to accomplish mm -hmm. through this thing and you'll see with most things that god is you know um not with most things pretty much everything god is uh, ordaining or instructing us to do he's either trying to shield us from satan or restore us to what was lost mm -hmm. and so prayer yeah. is like on a whole nother level of what he's trying to to accomplish. And so I, I, I think if, if we can follow along, some of this is going to be, you know, uh, I think common knowledge in a way, but maybe still a fresh perspective in other ways. Okay. And so we'll have a word of prayer and we'll try to lay this foundation and we'll, we'll ask this question. Why, is the, why do we have to pray to a God who knows what we're going to say before we say it? And I have another troublemaker question too for down the line. All right. What's that? Um, Biblically, what was the first prayer? What was the first prayer? Yeah. Who was the first one to, does he actually tell us that? Um, you know, I have never thought about it that, <laughs> that way. Uh, 
But, you know. Because in the garden, they kind of talked communally with. Well, yeah, that but, prayer was something that was put in place after the fall. After. If, you had, if you had open communion with uh, God, there's no need okay. right, you know, for prayer in what we, as we think of it today. Right. And right. that's where I said it's him trying to restore that which was lost. Because I'm thinking this has something to do when the, with the offerings and the smoke. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, when you think about the offerings and them bringing offerings, a part of that would be confessing your sins and, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing an offering, a part of that offering would also mm-hmm. be, you know, confessing sins and asking God for his forgiveness. Gotcha. So on and so forth. Gotcha. But, um, but yeah, so let's have this word of prayer and dive into this topic. Absolutely. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your throne once again by the merits of your son, Jesus Christ, acknowledging you as the high and holy one who knows the end from the beginning. And we thank you, Lord, that we have such a friend in you. And it would behoove us, Lord, Lord, and um, be wise of us to seek your counsel in all way, all things that you may direct our paths. And so, Lord, as we come to discuss the spiritual topics, we know that flesh and blood has not the ability to understand the things of God. So we ask for the promise of the Spirit to be with us and to be with everyone who will listen to um, this presentation. And please, Lord, bring us into harmony with your will and give us light, Lord, that will help us to understand the battle that we're in. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 So, what is prayer? What is God trying to accomplish through prayer? And so, before God was able to give me clarity on this question, he had to bring me into an understanding of thoughts in general. Okay. And so, that's where we have to start. And, you know, again, for some people or for a lot of people who are um, just been in their Christian walk for a while, this this may be common knowledge. Mm-hmm. But it's it's funny. Somebody sent me something on the other side of this. And, you know, it was about, um, well, just tell me, remind me to tell you the story later. I don't want to start on it. Okay. I want to start on this side of it. But um, let's talk about thoughts. Now, let me just ask you a question. Where do your thoughts come from? So do you want me to answer that from a perspective of what I know now or what I didn't know? <laughs> Either one. <laughs> Either one. So knowing what I know now, your thoughts come from two sources. Your thoughts are never really your own. They really resonate from either two places, yeah. either either God or Satan. Yes. And, and again, we I don't know how many times we're going to say this, and it's going to be said every episode. <laughs> it really goes back to the illustration of those two trees. Right. And you have a choice. There is no third choice. You know right. what I'm saying? Either it's of God or it is not. <laughs> That's right. That's not just as you hear everything else we say, no, Satan is not on the same, you know, level as God. Right. It's either of God or it's not. Right. And, and don't worry about any if it's not, you just want to avoid it. Right. You know what I'm <laughs> if it's not, you want to avoid it. So let's look at a quick scripture in First Corinthians four. First Corinthians four. What? This map and, and we're going to, you know, look at some scriptures. Some of them we'll be familiar with again, but we're going to be looking at them on a deeper level. Kind of how if you saw uh the episode we did on the roles of women and the work of women, women and men really. And we talked about the women at the well and that conversation Mm -hmm. that Christ had with her, what was going on beneath the surface of the conversation. You have to look at Christ's words that way. Christ is not communicating like we communicate. Mm -hmm. He's communicating with a full and perfect understanding of the spiritual warfare Mm -hmm. and this lesson about the thoughts we're about to talk about. Okay. So first we're going to look at something from Paul. First Corinthians chapter four. And we're going to look at verse 7, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 7. Paul says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou did not receive? Now, if thou did receive it, why dost thou glory if, as if thou had not received it? 
Now, the key part in this is that second phrase, and what hast thou that thou or that you did not receive? So what do you have that you didn't receive? So Paul is kind of putting out a challenge question. He's saying, please name something that you have that you haven't received. Mm. And he's, he's basically trying to tell you there's not one thing that you can name that you have that you haven't received from somewhere else. Mm. And so this was a part of, you know, how God helped me to understand thoughts because, you know, thoughts come into your mind and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And you think that, you know, I just had this thought. Mm-hmm. But that's not how this works. Okay. It's not how this works. So if you talk about your body, we can trace that back to your parents, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Who each gave a cell and you begin to develop in the womb of your mother. Mm-hmm. And we can trace all this all the way back to Adam and Eve and back to the dust of the ground. And God made them from the dust of the ground. Mm-hmm. Everything that we have, it has been received or it has been given. It was not originated with us. We did not originate anything. So let's go to Matthew 16 now. Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to look at another conversation that Christ was having. This is why I like to study Christ. Because Christ's conversations are so deep when you kind of peel back the surface and look at what he's doing. Okay. He is doing things in the cooperation with the spirit of God and against Satan. Everything. Mm. Everything. And he's always testing the waters with what he says. He's not just making statements. He's testing to see if the mind is open and in harmony with the Holy Spirit. Mm. So let's look at this conversation that he was having with his disciples. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to start at verse 13. All right, it says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now look at the question. Is Christ has access to talk to the Father. You know what I'm saying? Why is he asking them, who do men say that I am? Mm. Sorry. Let's look at the answer. Verse 14. And they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, other, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? With a question. Now, okay, all these people are saying all these things about who I am. Are they true? Yeah. No, they're not. So now he's turns to his disciples. Who do you say I am? Mm. All right. Who do you say that I am? Verse 16. And Simon Peter said, answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now look what um, Jesus says. He answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for what? Flesh and blood. What? Hath that not revealed it unto... What is he saying? Nothing that flesh and blood have not heard it. Now, Peter just said to him, All did. You are Christ, the Son of the living God. So what is he saying? So he's, he's basically saying, I know who you are, even though you haven't revealed yourself. Oh, basically, I'm talking about what Jesus said. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. What is he saying? And nobody told you this? Nobody, no human told you this? He's talking about Peter himself. Mm. Is not Peter flesh and blood? Yeah. Peter, this didn't come from you. Oh, okay, okay. Peter is flesh and blood. This, he's asking... This isn't coming from this thought, you don't know this of your own Thank you. Gotcha, okay. You, you, you... I look like a regular man. I was a carpenter's son, so on and so forth. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Peter. Listen. But my father, which is in heaven. So he's saying this thought that I am the Christ, the son of the living God, was a thought that proceeded to you from my father. Mm. So he's actually testing to see if they're open. Okay. To receive it. All right. Let's drop down to verse 20. All right. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples 
how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised a third day. So you see what happened after he answered the question that, that way. He began to tell them some things that was hard to hear. Now, they're walking with Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And they're excited about, you know, what this might mean. And the Messiah is here. Mm -hmm. And they, they're really thinking about, you know, he's going to set up his kingdom and we're going to be with him at the head of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's really what they think. <laughs> so he knows that he is moving close to coming to the cross and he wants to prepare them for that. So he throws out a test question to see if their mind is open to the Holy Spirit. So he first asked them, who do men say that I am? And then they give all these answers that Satan is putting into people's mind mm -hmm. so that people will not receive him as the Messiah. Maybe he's John the Baptist, or maybe he's one of the prophets. And you see how Satan doesn't mind you acknowledging Jesus as being a, a great man. But I don't want you to acknowledge him as the Messiah, the son of the living God. So Everybody's saying these things that are not true about Jesus, so they didn't come from God. God is not going to tell you that Jesus is John the Baptist or someone else. Okay. That's somebody else who's warring against Jesus, so you will not receive him for who he is. And you have other religions out there, even to this day, who say he didn't exist before he was born through Mary. He was a very great man, a wise man, and a prophet, but he was not the son of God. Okay. All right? So that's the work of another. Then he asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And they said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he's, cel he almost, he's celebrating. Blessed art thou. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. Now you're ready for me to tell you some things that are hard to hear because you're open to the Holy Spirit. Mm. So from that time forth, he began to tell them how he was going to go to Jerusalem and die. Now, let's look at the response of the disciples. Let's read from verse 21 again. From that time forth, from the time he asked them that question, and they answered the way he wanted, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be be unto thee. Verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, See? Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Do you see what just happened there? Yeah. Christ told him that he was about to go and he's going to be killed and rise the third day. The same person who just said, thou art Christ, the son of the living God, who it was revealed to him by the father, took Jesus after he said that and said, no, that's not what's going to happen. Mm. So basically, I'm telling you a lie. Christ doesn't speak jokes. Right. He speaks truth. When Peter made that statement, what did Christ say? Getting him behind. Satan. Satan. What is he saying? He's saying your thoughts are not, your thoughts are not, those thoughts are not coming from. Those thoughts aren't coming from my father. Yeah. That thought has came into your mind from Satan. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Do you, yeah. wait, 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 listen, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because he didn't even reference Peter. No, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. he, did, he, he, he didn't really reference Peter in the first state. He said, flesh and blood haven't revealed this to you, but my father, he's, rec he's recognizing the one who put the thought in Peter's uh, mind. Yes. In both situations. But I want you to see how quickly one can go from having a thought from God to a thought from Satan and voicing it. Mm -hmm. And one breath, Peter voices something that came direct from God. And the next breath, Peter voiced something that came directly from Satan. Wow. That's just a split in the matter of a... Thank you. Thank you. That's now, why, wow. That's why you got to be careful how you communicate with people. You see why I said the foundation of this has to be laid. Yeah. You have to understand that thoughts do not proceed from you or originate from you. They are given to you as a suggestion. And you have to choose which thoughts you're going to retain and which thoughts you're going to reject. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit giving you discernment. Yeah. As Peter basically 
because Peter's desire for the kingdom was so great, he didn't try to process and open himself up to the Holy Spirit to let him process what Christ was saying. Which was the bigger picture. Yeah. So all he heard when Christ said what he said, Satan put it in his mind immediately, if Christ dies, then there must be no king. Mm. So he just answered off the cuff, no, that can't be. Now here I am trying to give you a more correct understanding of my mission as Messiah, but you will not let go of what you've been taught by some teachers who taught you some error. Mm. See what I'm saying? How dangerous error can be? Now Christ wants to actually reveal his purposes to you, but you're not willing to let go of an error that would help you to see it. Right. But this situation right here helps you to see that thoughts don't proceed from just anywhere. And one um, part of the conversation, Christ acknowledges that Peter received the thought from heaven, from the Father. Mm. And the next part of the conversation, Christ recognizes that the thought that came out of Peter's mouth came from Satan. Yeah. So that your thoughts do not proceed from you, or that should I say proceed, but originate with us. All right? So, all that we call our thoughts come from two sources, as we said in the beginning, either Christ or Satan. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like to use that situation right there, because if you study it correctly, it becomes clear mm -hmm. what's going on. And mm. the thoughts we choose will play the dominant role in what character we develop. As we said, we've been saying really for a long time, your thoughts will be seen in what you say and what you do. There, there's no way around that. You know what I'm saying? There's no way around that. What is in your mind is going to be reflected in what you do. I mean, what you eat, what you drink, what you say, how you react. It's all going to come from the thoughts that are in your mind. I mean, and even, uh, you know, and we talked about the law, um, but when people say Christ came to fulfill a law, you know, he made it very clear, even with his law, it's like it's not so much as you break a law. It's like if you think it, you. That's where it starts. Everything. <laughs> you're not just going to be walking one day and just break a law. <laughs> First is going to start as an idea in your mind. Right. And this is why we we get into, you know, uh, music and mm. entertainment. What do you think these are? Mm. Thoughts put the music. That's 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 what your songs you listen to. And what do they do? They influence your thoughts. Yeah. So who has influence over the mind of the artist that you listen to? Satan, both Christ and Satan have in, invented different ways to get their thoughts into your mind. Now, God uses nature. If you go out into nature and you see the amazingness of nature, it will work on your mind to see or just just to watch a bird take off from the ground. If you just actually pay attention and look at how amazing that is, it starts to impress your mind with God's creative power and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So but at the same time and, you know, throughout the uh, Bible, like the Psalms and David mm -hmm. with the songs and even how he ended up. Um, being right next to Saul mm -hmm. was because Saul had an evil spirit mm -hmm. and he needed somebody to play godly music and so the spirits would you know depart from his wow. not, not so much depart but that's how powerful music was yes yes and once again we have to remember um, you know the creation of Satan and what he's uh, known for oh yeah music music yeah so when you talk about, you know, other types of entertainment, you know, the script had to be written by somebody, which means it started off as thoughts in somebody's mind. They wrote it down. They gave it. And then the thoughts are just acted out in front of you. And as a writer, that's why I had to step back and change what I was writing, um, because you realize, you know, the power of influence that you have. And when you're putting the wrong things in different in people's minds. Yeah. You know, you become responsible for that. Yeah. So it's like, um, all right, I got to I got to fix that. Yeah. 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 So you, you want to make sure if you are a child of God, that God approves of everything that you do. Yeah. You know, so and, yeah. and the Bible itself, you know, when we're reading the Bible, there's things going into our mind. Yes. So God is trying to yes. use his word, you know, to help us 
within our mind to be able to to to, to, to discern <laughs> good and evil. Yes. All right. So let let's talk some philosophical type of truth. Okay. All right. Prior to sin, and I mean prior to all sin, all thoughts were in harmony with God. Every thought. No, not in the garden. In heaven. Before Lucifer fell, the only set of thoughts were those in harmony with God because there was no sin. All right. After Lucifer misused his free will, a second realm of thought came into existence. All right. You follow me so far? Follow you. Now, I'm wondering just really quick. Why? I guess because of his power and his position. He's the only one that just decided because everybody else could have. Yeah. So because and of, they did. Well, after the fact. After I, he yeah. The, after he did it. But I wonder what was so adamant in him to just say, hey, I'm going to be the first one or I. Well, he he didn't. I don't think he said it like that. I, <laughs> you know, um, if again, we, we did studies on this. You go back and look at the early, early on. Yeah. First tragedy. We kind of covered that. And, yeah. and the Bible covers it in Ezekiel and Isaiah 14. And we can't really go deep into that right now. Right. But basically, it's kind of like a three-step process. First, you kind of take your eyes off of God and stop appreciating God for what he did for you. Mm -hmm. And then you start to look at yourself and what you have as if, you know, because of what you've been given, you can be more than what God you know, um, stationed you to be. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to covet that that position that you don't have. Mm -hmm. So it's a turning away from God towards self. Then, you know, uh, covetousness. Okay. Yeah, I do remember we did talk yeah. about the three step process. Yeah. yeah. So it it, it kind of goes in that uh, process, and that's the same thing he did with Eve. First, he made Eve distrust God, and kind of turned her toward herself. You know, you can be like God. Mm -hmm. And then she began to, you know, look, well, maybe I can be and so on and so forth. And then she began to covet the fruit that would make her that thing. Wow. So that's where the CIA and all the agencies get all of this strategy. from. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. again, before uh, sin, before Lucifer's sin, everybody's mind was in harmony with God. Mm -hmm. And the only thoughts that went through their mind would be in harmony with God. Mm hmm once Lucifer sinned, there became a alternative. And then from that time, you had a choice. Rather, you were going to adhere to God or you're going to believe this alternative. Okay. And we know from scripture that many angels did, you know, end up siding with Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Now, here is something that, you know, may be hard for some people to grasp. I hope it's not. You know what I'm saying? I hope it's not, but because a truly original thought takes creative power, Lucifer has never had an original thought. God alone is the only one that can have an original thought. Now, the realm of thought that Satan has is either a negation or a perversion of the thought of God. If you actually study Satan's thoughts and, and what it is, it is always a negation of what God said or a perversion of what God said. Right. But it's not something that's truly original. So we just looked at um, the situation in Matthew 16 with Peter. Mm -hmm. Christ said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die, raise a third day. And then Satan put a thought in Peter's mind. What was it? You know, this is not going to happen to you. See, it was just a negation of what Christ said. It wasn't an original thought. Right. In the beginning, we go back to the uh, trees. God said, if you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. What was Satan's thought? You shall not surely die. See what I'm saying? It's just a negation of what God says. Right. So that's all he can do. He can and only... Back to his limitation. He, God is the only one that has the power to create. Yes. Yeah. An original thought actually takes creative power. Is that deep. And so the that's why there's only two choices. Mm -hmm. there's either God or a negation or a perversion of what God has said. Mm. That's it. There's no third realm of thought. Either you're going to be in perfect 
agreement with God, or you're going to negate something that God says, or you're going to pervert something that God says. Okay. Those are the only two realms of thoughts. That's why the tree, again, is called the knowledge of good, good and evil, because what is it based on? Good. good. The original thought was good. But you sprinkle evil you, in there. But you negated something or you perverted something and it becomes evil. So light represents like truth, whereas darkness represents, you know, sin, evil, Satan, and so on and so forth. Light and darkness. Now, light is actually power. There's something there. There's a spectrum of it and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. What is darkness? The absence of light. See what I'm saying? It actually isn't anything. It's just the absence of light. So Satan may take away something that God says or just negate it, but it's not actually anything new. So mm -hmm. even the darkness that represents him, it has no real substance to it. Light has a real substance. But what represents him, darkness, it really doesn't. It's just mm -hmm. the absence of light. All right, because without God, there is no, without the absence of God, God needs to exist in order for there to be absence, in order for well, the darkness to be. No, no, no. Well, not even that. I'm saying that wrong. Um, you know, like you said, in order to, you know, he has to be, have something to negate, basically. Yes. That's what I'm trying exactly. to say. Yeah. He can't have an original thought, so all he can do is either negate what's there or pervert what's there. Right. So, the Bible says... In one place, it says, the new wine is found in the cluster. One saith, destroy it not, for it is a blessing. All right, so new wine is basically talking about wine that is not fermented. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to get deep into this uh, debate about should we be drinking wine or not, because, you know, Jesus made water into wine, but did he make it fermented wine or did he make it new wine? Mm. See what I'm saying? Because the Bible uses wine for both. Okay. But when you're talking about fermented wine, that is called strong drink. Mm -hmm. Now, wine can be used for either one, mm -hmm. either what they call new wine, which is like grape juice, and then strong drink, which is fermented um, wine. Mm -hmm. Now, of strong drink is said, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Mm -hmm. So strong drink is a deceiver. And mm -hmm. to me, that makes it clear. You know what I'm saying? So what type of wine is the Bible uh, promoting it's actually promoting unfermented wine but that's not what we're talking about <laughs> if wine is a mocker and strong big is raging and it's a deceiver that means it's of satan mm. but how where did he get the wine from how did he get the did he create the wine no or did he pervert the greek mm. so rather is it in the realm of thought or if it's in the physical realm he has no creative power he can only take that which God made good and negate it or pervert it. Interesting. So no matter where you look, on the physical level, the mental level, the spiritual level, that's what he does. So for our advanced thinkers um, and our advanced uh, followers, just take this information and go back and revisit the series about the Antichrist and, and see where the application leads you um, with that. You, you might have some new discovery. All right. All right. So what does all this have to do with prayer? All this is a foundation to talk about prayer. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can grab hold to this thought that all thoughts proceed from somewhere, it goes back to that question that I asked. If God knows what you're going to say before you say it, why should you have to pray? Now, after God laid this foundation for me, and showed me about the realm of thought. Then when I, I, and I wasn't even thinking about the question at this time. And I kneeled down to pray. And this thought came vividly into my mind. I know what you're going to say. But you don't know what you're going to say. Right. See what I'm saying? And when he, after, I, at that moment, it was like a flood of understanding came in like, oh my goodness. You're trying to get me to open my mind up to you when I pray so that you can put in me what you want me to ask for. Yeah. And basically, you'll be revealing to me what you are ready to do or you want to do in my life. Not that you're ready, because this is where we make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God is going to reveal to you um, something that he wants you to do, not because you're ready for it, but he wants you to prepare yourself for it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, he revealed to Abraham that he was going to have a son. 
didn't happen for a long time. Mm-hmm. And Abraham went about trying to make it happen. Right. And so, <laughs> right. Same thing with Moses. It was revealed to him that he was going to be the one to li- deliver the people. And he went out and smote an Egyptian and killed them. You know what I'm saying? As if that was going to be the way God was going to do it. Right. So just because God reveals something to you doesn't mean that you're ready for it. Mm. But during prayer, what you're doing is, or what God is trying to um, establish is that you will take time to turn your focus away from the world and turn your focus toward heaven. Mm. And while he has your attention, then he can in real time put in your mind those things which proceed from him Mm. so that it comes from him to you back up to him mm. and you you may have heard um the term the power of prayer mm-hmm. the power of prayer now um one time i uh, me and my wife were having some work done in our house and we had an electrician come to do some rewiring mm-hmm. and um i was with him because he was a friend of ours and he was explaining to me how power works. And he was like, the power has to come. At, you know how uh, in the Bible, God may take someone and say, go down to the potter's house. And they go down to the potter's house and they watch the potter doing something. Mm-hmm. And God teaches them a lesson. Mm-hmm. That's what happened to me that day. <laughs> okay. I'm with the electrician. And the electrician is teaching, just telling me basically how power works. And he was like, the power has to come, you know, from the power plant, you know, I, through the wires into your house Mm -hmm. and it goes through the wire in your house back out to, you know, the wires and back to the power plant. And it's a circuit, you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And it's the same if you have a battery powered something, Mm -hmm. you know, if you have, let's just say a, a light hooked up with a battery, Mm -hmm. the electricity flows from one end of the battery through the wiring to the bulb and it lights it. And then that same current of power goes back out another wire into the other end of the battery. Okay. And it's because that flow in that circuit that the um, thing lights up and you have what we call power. And what a switch is, is something that simply takes the circuit and separates it. That's it. And so Satan is a master of circuit breakers. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you kneel down to pray Mm. And all of a sudden, all these different thoughts start coming into your mind. Right. See what I'm saying? Thoughts don't just come from anywhere. You kneel down to pray to God. Then all of a sudden, all of these thoughts are coming into your mind because Satan is trying to break that circuit before you realize what God is actually trying to do. Now, have you guys experienced? Uh, Everybody had. Um, that we love to kind of hear. Yes. And so the reason our prayers, we can know we have the answer to our prayers is because they're supposed to proceed from God first Mm -hmm. and not from you. We ask according to his will. Well, he has to reveal his will. And so because in the beginning of our experience, God knows our mind Mm -hmm. is is not exercised to this practice Mm -hmm. and it is clouded, he's given us his word. And so we have the Bible, which has on the surface of it certain promises that he wants to fulfill. Mm -hmm. So because you can't discern his voice in the beginning, he wrote promises that you can see on the pages so that you first go to his word, then you ask him to fulfill what he said. Okay. And as you start to do this, you get in the practice of asking God for what he wants to do and not just what you want from him. Okay. And so let's just take one of those promises, the basic promise. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. He was teaching them about prayer. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Don't worry about what you shall eat, what you shall drink, all of those physical things that God knows you need, which shows that you're focused more on the flesh than you are on your relationship with God. Mm. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So he's, he's teaching you when you come to pray, that's where you can begin. Okay. Begin right there. And so there's different promises in the Bible to get you started until you get to the place where, you know, he can commune with you on that level. But really, prayer is power because of that circuit. The power or the thought or the thing that you're requesting or whatever is supposed to come from God first. Mm -hmm. 
end to you. You know how they say or, on cartoons or when a person gets an idea? Bing. Right, right, right. Thank you. Does a light bulb light itself? Yeah. Thank you. That's why the, uh, the actual illustration is great because mm. the light bulb doesn't light itself. The light bulb lights because a current came from somewhere else through the light bulb. Right. And so it's supposed to come from God to us, back out from us, back up to God. Mm. And then as God, you know, um, we yield to God and he brings us to the place where he can do the thing. He's actually trying to reveal to you his will for your life. You know, that's that's where he wants to get us to in our maturity, where he can begin to reveal his will for our life. Mm -hmm. Not that you're ready for it that day. Don't make that mistake. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if he tells you the what, please wait for him to tell you the how. Okay. You know what I'm saying this is where great men have fallen. Yes. Just because <laughs> he tells you the what, do not think that you have enough wisdom to know the how. Okay. All right. And so when God does answer that thing, like you, you send up the prayer, then God begins to send the providences and the answers mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. You also are supposed to send back praise to God. Mm. God, you know, does the thing, the blessing comes and that same circuit is not supposed to be broken. Mm. So he sends you the knowledge of what he wants to do. You say it, it comes back up. God receives it. This person's mind is open to me. Just like when Christ was on earth, he's trying to see if your mind is open to him. Okay. When you come to in prayer, God wants to see that your mind is open to him. If okay. you start praying about all the burdens Lucifer is putting on you, you know what I'm saying? Like your mind is so bogged down with what Lucifer is putting on you that you can't even hear me anymore. Not that God is not going to ignore you. He's still going to try to help you through it. But he wants to get you to the place where only what he is thinking matters. Wow, this is kind of weird. It, uh, this, this idea just kind of popped up. It's kind of, you know, when you shop on Amazon, it pops up, we think you might need this. And it's like, <laughs> you know what, I do. And then you order it, and then it actually comes in the mail, and you get it. It's, it kind of feels like that. It's like Amazon knows your pattern based on your history, so God knows you, knows what you need. And then it's just like, I mean, you know, God, God knows his destiny where well, he has destined for you. Well, he knows what he's destined for you. Yeah. You know, but in the same, it just kind of reminds me of that process is like, you're not even, you might be on there looking for whatever. It's just like, you know what? We know that you need this. And yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. You're and saying. it's just something you come to God with something and it's like, well, you don't really need that. We right. really need <laughs> Right. Right. This is what you really need. Right. Yeah. Right. You're asking right. for a new car. It's just like. Nah, you don't need a car because you don't know I'm about to move you when you don't even need no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or you don't know you're about to have twins and that sports car you're trying to get. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's right. not going to work. Right. So, so yeah. And so there's supposed to be this circuit that prayer is supposed to create. Mm -hmm. And remember um, how I mentioned in the beginning that God is trying to restore that which is lost. Mm -hmm. And what sin really did was cut off that communion with God. And mm -hmm the different things that he's asking us to do is to put us in the place where that communion is restored. Okay. And so through the word, he's trying to teach our mind to discern good and evil so that we will think the thoughts that he thinks mm. through prayer. We're supposed to be asking for the things that we see in the word and the word again, bringing us into harmony with God. When we go out to witness, because we don't know the people that we're talking to, we have to depend on him to tell us what to say to those people. So every work that he's given us to do is to make us open up ourselves to receive from him that which will restore that communion that we lost in the beginning. Yes. So that's what I said. Outside of all these controversial topics, there are the very um, essentials of the gospel and what God is trying to accomplish with, you know, the gospel, with his word and with the things that he ordains. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't want to prolong it too long. But let's just look at another story that uh, kind of depicts this. Okay. And we're not going to read all of the story but because it's too long. But I will give the backdrop. Do you remember um, when Abraham had sent out his servant to find a wife for Isaac? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So there came a time when Abraham, after Sarah had died, that he sent his servant to um, his father's house to find a wife for um, 
Isaac. Right. And so the servant, you know, gathered up all the things that he needs to take with him. And he went on this journey, not really knowing where he was going. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But he, he, he did this because he was a faithful servant to Abraham. Mm-hmm. And so let's go to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. And again, this there are stories within the story, you know, and, and things that af- as you study from Genesis to Revelation that start to pop out to you that you might not see the first time you go through the Bible. So, um, let's go to verse 12. And this is the servant talking. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show me kindness unto my master Abraham. So what is he doing here? Well, where should we at? Verse 12. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. All right. So he said again, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. So basically, he's on his journey. He's got to a certain point and he stops to pray. Okay. So for some reason, the thought to stop here and pray comes into his mind. Okay. All right. Remember, thoughts don't come from just anywhere. Right. If you can understand that as you study the Bible, the Bible becomes a whole new book. Mm-hmm. If you can understand that you will not see God, you will not see Satan, but thoughts don't come from just anywhere. As you start to study the Bible from Old and New Testament, now you start to see those two stars, you know, the antagonists and the protagonists all the way through mm-hmm. and the thoughts and ideas that come into people's mind. Mm-hmm. And then the Bible becomes a whole new book. Verse 13, behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall drink, and so she shall say drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born of Bethuel, son of Milchai's, and the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw waters for thy camels also until they have done drinking. All right. Now, this man was just inspired (laughs) to stop and pray and ask for something very, very specific. Yeah. Let the woman that I say, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to say blah, blah, blah. Right, 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 right. You You need this criteria. This criteria. Give me slice of drink. And what are the camels also? Mm-hmm. And the, he, before he's finished praying, here comes the very woman from the very house that he's been sent to. And and she does the very thing that he says in prayer she should do. So obviously what happened here was a thought to stop and pray came from God. Mm-hmm. The things to ask for came from God. Mm-hmm. Not only this, at the same time, the thought to go to the well at this exact moment had to be coming to Rebecca's mind. And when he, this stranger asked her to do this, the thought to do it with cheerfulness had to also be in. Now, let's see what happens. Verse 21. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring, a half a shekel weight, and two bracelets for a hand, and ten shekels of, of ten shekels weight of gold, and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milchai, she bare unto Nahal. And let's drop down to verse 26. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord, 
And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who have not left destitute my master of his mercy and tr his truth, and being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And so again, he stops, he prays, the Lord puts the exact thing to ask for in his mind. Mm -hmm. Before he's finished praying, the very thing that came into his mind is coming his way, the, the, the woman. Then he's, he's still in um, disbelief, really, like, is this really happening the way it's, it's happening? And so he asks her, and she, he finds out that she is from the very house that he was looking for. And the first thing he does is send praise, praise. back up. See the circuit? Yeah. See the circuit. And from I God to him, back to God, and he finds out, he gets confirmation of the blessing, and praise back up. Perfect circuit. And not to mention, you know, when God is in the mix, he don't just send no any old thing. It, it makes it a point to say she was fine. Is it makes it a point like you're looking for someone and it's like it's not just old, any old lady coming out or whatever. He's sending you it's, if something if, great. If you let him decide for you, <laughs> you know, I, I've heard all t types of people or, or different things against this. Like, mm. I ain't got no choice and I ain't got to. You know, you've got a choice. <laughs> you have a choice. Right. The thing is, God gave us a choice. Right. But the wisest thing you could do with that choice is to let God choose for you. Mm. If you have somebody who knows the end from the beginning, wouldn't it be wise to let him make the choice for you? Now, you can make the choice on your own. Now, had he had made that choice and just went and, 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 and grabbed the first woman that he saw and brought, and that's pulled to be this man's wife, you know, it's kind of like, wait a minute, you didn't have, it was nothing but, yeah, God See, is in something great. Why, why do you think Abraham chose his servant? Mm. there's a lot said about this servant in this story that we didn't that let me say it, there's a lot said about this servant in this uh scenario that you would skip right over right that tells you a lot about his character mm. you know it says that everything that abraham had was in his power okay which means he was a Joseph before. I was, Joseph. I was just about to say that reminds me of Joseph. Yeah. He was a Joseph in Abraham's house that he had full run and reign over everything. This story is showing us what type of servant he was. He was not the type he had learned from Abraham. And this is an example of what Solomon said that, you know, um, a servant born in a man's house will in the end be his son. Mm. He is what he is because he grew up around Abraham. And that wisdom, he actually gravitated to it. And if Abraham having wisdom begins to give him more and more responsibility until he got to the place where basically I don't have to worry about my stuff. Wow. He can look over it. And you talk about the most important decision of his son's life, he put in the hands of his servant. So hidden within that, when you, when you say the servant self become a son, and because he was around Abraham, that's also, I would think, a mandate as men to teach your household, your family, your sons how to pray. I think I think that's something that we need to take as as heads and follow that example and say, because if he hadn't and the servant had no idea, had no had, had no uh, desire, had no understanding, had no thought process of how to pray and and what to pray for and you know he goes out there just on his own accord and own knowledge and own it's kind of like when so when you're sending your sons out there you need to prepare them yeah. to know like all right you need to be in communion with god and this is how you do it and when before you send them on any journey out in the world yeah, like, yeah this this like i said wow it's a lot to unpack that this. detail lets you know how much trust abraham had in his servant when it said that one little sentence, you know, you, you're a screenwriter. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. If, if you have an hour and a half, two hours, you can't take 30 minutes to right. develop a character. You know what right. I'm saying? Not every character that's in, you know, right. the uh, in the film. Right. But if that character is in there, if even for 15 seconds, you have enough. You should have enough time to say enough to let people know. Yeah. And that one line that says everything that his master had or everything that Abraham had was in his power. Yeah. And you know what type of person Abraham has. That speaks for him already. Like, Abraham trusted him with everything. Yeah. 
Abraham is trusting him to find a wife, his daughter-in-law, the man, his son, I mean, the woman, his son is going to, to marry. Yeah. This man must have a stellar character. Yes. Just that little bit lets you know about him. Wow. And again, you know, studying from a writer's standpoint, it, it, it becomes a whole, a whole new book. Wow. So many lessons packed in, into just this one, one, one little, one, yeah, little scenario. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll touch upon one more thing. One more thing. And, you know, when you, uh, well, let's just say this. You know the censor um, in the sanctuary. You know what I'm saying? The, yeah. the, high, the high priest, not just the high priest, but there was a cen- you know, there was a censor in the sanctuary. You had what was called the altar of incense. Mm-hmm. And on the day of atonement, the high priest was supposed to take what was called the golden censer and put incense on it and then walk with that into the most holy place. Okay. All right. Because of course the altar of incense was too big to carry. So it was something that you could carry. I'll actually give you an image. Okay. So um, we can put it on the screen at that um, in the editing, but it actually um, is like a golden pot. And it had, would have smoke coming out of it from the incense. Okay. All right. Now, we said this before. If you go to Psalms, I think it's 141 verse 2. David says, let my prayer be set before thee as incense. Okay. So that incense represents prayer. Now, when we pray, who are we praying to? Praying to God. God. Is God all powerful? Yes. Can God do anything? Yes. Now, remember, the thing that the high priest carried was a golden kind of pot that has smoke coming out of it. Mm-hmm. Now, you ever heard of a thing called Aladdin's lamp? Mm-hmm. What, what, the what, genie in it? How would the genie come out? He had to rub it three times. Yeah, but what would he come out first? Smoke. Thank you. And what would you do when the genie come out? You would ask for three wishes. You would ask him for something. It's a counterfeit of prayer. If you look at the sensor next to a genie lamp, it's almost identical mm. because remember, Satan cannot originate anything. Wow. He can only pervert. Wow. Once you understand that, you'll see everything that he has that is a deception is based on something that's true. The golden censer is a little pot that has smoke coming out of it that represents requests made to an all powerful being that can do anything. Wow. The genie lamp is the same thing. It's a lamp that has smoke coming out of it that's supposed to um, have a being that's powerful that can do amazing things. But one question real quick. Have you ever heard of a person asking a genie for righteousness? Is that the type of things that people ask genies for? <laughs> I don't think so. What type of things would they ask genies for? Um, physical things, riches. Riches, wealth. Yeah. Or harem. Power. Power. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride. See, it's a counterfeit. You have a choice. There's two supernatural powers out there who can do great things for you. One is them going to cater to your flesh. The other is going to cater to righteousness. And it's interesting. You said this before that uh, we treat God like a genie in a bottle when we come to him for prayer sometimes. Why do you think? Why do you think the counterfeit was set up? The counterfeit is set up so that you will enter into prayer like you would with a genie. Mm. And where with a genie, your wish is my command. With God, no, your wish is my command. You know what I'm saying? The genie reverses it. The genie says, you, human being, your wish is my command. No, not with prayer to God. Prayer to God. The human being says to God, your wish is my command. See the flip? He can't originate a thought. He can only negate it or pervert it, reverse it. That's it. Once you understand the Bible this way, everything in life starts to become vivid and clear. Nothing new under the sun. That was deep. Oh, man. Yeah, we, we always kind of have a uh, special treat for those who watch all the way to the end, right? Right. Some of the best things are said right there at the end. Right. 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 And, and it's the same with God. The longer you stay with God, the sweeter 
the rewards we come at the end. You do not get the best from the beginning with God. It's kind of like when, when Jesus was at the wedding and he transformed the water to wine and the, the uh, master of the governor of the feast was like, most people put out the best and go first, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you save the good stuff for last. Right. That's God. So if you're watching the videos and you don't watch it all the way through, more than likely you miss the best thing. And yeah. that's why even in, in life, in the gospel, the best part of the gospel is going to be the final, the very final um, proclamation of the gospel at the end. And I, I can't go into that now. I mean, wow. I'll do a study on that one day. Wow. So that means you got to hit the notification buttons to know when that drops. So <laughs> you got to, we got to get a lot of comments asking. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, wow. That was, um, once again, another amazing, uh, story. Like I've, I've been through, you know, you know, the circuit and, you know, definitely had an understanding, but some things were, were even more to, like for me, like I said, I'm here studying and there's nothing, you know, you know, at any given point, it's just like, I'm learning something new and I hope you guys are experiencing the same thing. Um, so we thank you again for joining us and, you know, we, we hope that you stay prayed up in, in the right way and we will see you next week. Oh yeah, next week I believe. Yeah, next week, next episode, next Sunday. Hit the notification button and make sure that you find out when we drop the next video. Um, once again, thank you again and God bless. Amen.